Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman. I'm a producer and editor here in the Author Events Office, and tonight it is my pleasure to introduce Patrick Radden Keefe, referred to by Rolling Stone as a master of narrative nonfiction. Patrick Radden Keefe is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty, a critical history of the family responsible for making and marketing painkillers that led to the opioid crisis. It won the 2021 Bailey Gifford Prize and was a National Book Critics Circle nominee. Oh, much better. Uh, <laughs> Keefe is also uh, an award-winning staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of three other books, including the National Book Critics Circle Award winner, Say Nothing, A True Story of Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland, The Snakehead, An Epic Tale of the Chinatown Underworld and the American Dream, and Chatter, Dispatches from the Secret World of Global Eavesdropping. His other honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship and the National Magazine Award for Feature Writing. He wrote and hosted the podcast, Wind of Change, selected as the number one podcast of 2020 by The Guardian. He joins us tonight with his latest book, Rogues, True Stories of Grifters, Killers, Rebels, and Crooks. Uh, writing about such disreputable figures, such as wine counterfeiters, illegal arms traffickers, and Swiss money launderers. Rogues is a collection of 12 of Keefe's New Yorker articles about, you guessed it, corruption, fraud, and power. Uh, these stories, he writes in the book's prologue, uh, were written over a dozen years, and they reflect some of my abiding preoccupations. Crime and corruption, secrets and lies, the permeable membrane separ separating licit and illicit worlds, the bonds of family, the power of denial. A Los Angeles uh, Times review proclaims that it's highly entertaining, of course, but what shines through most br brightly is Keefe's fascination with what makes us human, even when we're at our most imperfect. Tonight's author will be in conversation with Karen Heller. She's a national features writer for the Washington Post, formerly a Metro and features columnist here at the Philly Enquirer and a finalist for the 2001 Pulitzer Prize in Commentary. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Patrick uh, Radden Keefe and Karen Heller to the Free Library. They asked me to introduce Patrick tonight, and um, I was reminded of what Mikhail Baryshnikov said of Fred Astaire when he was asked to introduce him. He said, I've, and I'm paraphrasing, I've been invited to say something about how writers feel about Patrick. It's no secret, we hate him. <laughs> um, he is just enormously gifted. Um, last year, um, uh, Empire Pain was one of our 10 best books um, in the Washington Post. Um, we all agreed. And now here he is with just another, this is just a splendid, splendid book. I cannot recommend this enough, there goes my pen. And there are only 60 copies upstairs, I think. Maybe there are 80, so you better get one, okay? Um, it's a collection over 12 years. I think you've, mm -hmm. you've been working 15 years at the New Yorker, but a 12-year period. Uh, it's a, your dirty dozen, all uh, right, of uh, rogues and whatever. And I, um, I'm just fascinated um, how you pursue this. He's a master of the write around, um, which for those of you who don't know, is when the subject will not agree to speak to them. Uh, you have to write around them. And I don't want to brag, but I'm simply horrible at this. Um, so I'm particularly in awe. I want to read a quote by somebody um, who said this about Patrick. Every time he tells me a new story idea, I feel like I'm going to have a mini heart attack. Oh, geez, another litigious asshole or murderous criminal? Can't you do a celebrity profile or something? That's his wife talking. <laughs> Patrick is intrigued by all the bad guys. Um, he is absolutely the master of the perfect landing. Um, he, he gets these quotes, they're just so gorgeous. I would be leading with them, and you meet them out, you, you wait for them. Um, he ha has things, he wrote about um, pursuing the elusive Israeli billionaire Benny Steinmetz, who landed an iron mining deal in the impoverished Republic of Guinea for a song, $160 million, to re potentially reap billions. This is what he wrote. 
the Western world has always thought of Africa as a continent to take things from, whether it was diamonds, rubber, or slaves. The World Bank estimates that 40% of the private wealth in Africa is held outside the continent. When you disembark from a plane in Conakry, Conakry? Conakry. Conakry. the corruption hits you almost quickly, as quickly as the heat. That's extraordinary quote. Um, he pursued Benny Steinmetz. Let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> this is quite a story. Um, how long, how did this story start? Yeah, it took a while. I should say, first of all, thank you so much, Karen, for doing this and for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to all of you for coming out. My first time at the Free Library, it's great to be here. But I love Philadelphia. I ran the marathon here uh, in the fall. And so um, that was a slightly painful experience. <laughs> Um, exacerbated by the weird thing that Philly uh, marathon supporters do, which is they keep offering you beer as you're going, and I just felt like I was dying, and all these people are thrusting beer at me. Um, but uh, but it's great to be back here, and thank you for coming out. Um, so that story was a. Um, it took about a year, and. Um, it started with, I, I heard that there was this guy, Benny Steinmetz, who I'd never heard of, but at the time was the wealthiest man in Israel. And he had, um, he had started in the diamond trade, but he went to Guinea in West Africa and was after this huge iron ore deposit. And Guinea is one of the poorest countries in the world. And what happened is there was a lot of corruption there. And he came in, and as you said, for a very small amount of money, he got the rights to this deposit. Then he basically flipped it. He, so for you know, the price of some bribes, basically, he was able to uh, get the rights to the deposit. And then he, he turned around and sold half of the deposit to a big Brazilian mining giant for $2.5 billion. And there was a new president in Guinea who had um, campaigned on a kind of anti-corruption basis. And his he, when he came in, he felt like, we're this incredibly poor country. We have all these amazing natural resources. There's this great quote that he, he said to me. He said, how can we be so rich and yet so poor? This doesn't compute. And he thought part of the reason was that you had these wealthy, unscrupulous foreigners who came in and basically exploited these resources in a way that wouldn't benefit the people. So, this, this, new, this new president is there, his name is Alpha Conde, and I was able to get an interview with him. Um, and I went over to, to Guinea and, and got to know him. I actually interviewed him twice, because I, first I went to Davos and interviewed him there. Um, but Benny Steinmetz was this elusive guy. He's like a, you know, he's, he's almost like a villain in a Bond movie yeah, exactly, or something. Exactly. He's just this kind of, um, uh, this kind of tanned, good looking, um, guy who doesn't really live in any one place. He has a private jet. He's always kind of jetting from place to place. He works out every day. He's extremely kind of casual. He has this very firm handshake. He never gives interviews. And I had to chase him all around. I went, um, he has corporate offices in London. And so I went to London because I thought I might be able to meet with him there. When I got there, they said, oh, too late. He just left for Paris. Mm -hmm. So I went to Paris. And when I got to Paris, they said, ah, oh, he just got on his private jet to Israel. And um, I had to call and get approval from my editor. But I said, all right, I'll fly to Israel. You know, But I want to guarantee that I'll meet him when I'm there. I'm not going to get to Tel Aviv and be told that he's just flown to Africa. Um, and they said, well, we can't really give you a guarantee. And so then there was a lot more haggling. And eventually, I went and met him in the south of France, where he was staying on his mega yacht off of Cap d'Antibes and interviewed him for yes, four hours there. This is what she wrote. As I entered the lobby, I brushed past a slim, deeply tanned man wearing a blue linen shirt that was buttoned halfway to his navel, not yours. Um, it was Steinmetz. <laughs> Thank you for making the trip, he said when I introduced myself. He seized my hand with a formidable grip of someone who puts a lot of stock in a handshake. Um, I just couldn't believe that you actually got this guy because, you know, so there was a year. Yeah, sort of year yeah. Of and quite many a countries. And many countries, yeah. And that was actually the, you know, that was one of those interviews actually where, um, where it was really revealing in the end. He, I mean, it's very often the case writing about billionaires. I find when th that they're so. If you do get the interview, they have PR people, they've got lawyers in the room, and it's it's almost not worth the interview um, because they're so constrained in what they'll mm -hmm. where they'll let you go. Um, but in his case, I actually, you know. 
it, it ended up, you know, the, ju the juice was worth the squeeze. In yes. The end, <laughs> um, that's, that, that's a wonderful story. So let's talk about um, Amy Bishop, which mm. is a, not as um, a, a happy, well, not ha happy is the wrong word, but. Um, happy is never the, the word. No, never, never the word with your um, story. So um, Amy Bishop, um, this is a very sad story. I'm going to try and find it. Um, she, um, well, she was a neurobiologist at the University of Alabama, and she um, shot six people one day. She was denied tenure, three of them fatally. And what her court-appointed lawyer said to you, that, again, an amazing quote, there are people in our community who are walking time bombs. They are so hard to identify. The morning after she was arrested, a suburban Boston chief of police called the sheriff in Huntsville. So this is, like, like Patrick has just set this up. He has... You're in the room when she just goes off, and it, it's frightening. And it, you know, you pop, pop. You know, the, the it's extraordinary. And we're, I want to talk about screenwriting and the effect on your writing. I mean, it's very terrifying, like you're in a movie. And then, you know, I would never have this much faith. But like three pages in, you say, "So this is this like holy crap moment." The, this Boston chief of police says, "The woman you have in custody. I thought you'd want to know." She shot her and killed her brother back in 1986. And women mass murder is very rare. This woman went to Harvard. And that's the detective story that you chose to follow. Why don't you tell us uh, all yeah, about Yeah, sure. I mean, so that was, um, so that originally my, my, this is really all credit goes to my editor at The New Yorker. He brought this story to me um, about this mass shooting in 2010 in Alabama. And I said, I have no desire to write that story. I don't care about a mass shooter. I don't care why they did it. I don't care what their motivations were. Um, you know, pass. And he said, no, no, no. Here's what's really interesting. So in 2010, she shot these colleagues. But it emerged after that mass shooting that in 1986, when she was 21 years old, she had shot and killed her brother with a shotgun, her teenage brother. And there was one witness. It was their mother. And when the cops came, the mother said, I saw the whole thing. It was an accident. And what my editor said to me was, the story isn't Amy Bishop, the mass shooter in 2010. Uh, the story is a mother in 1986 who has only two kids, and she witnesses one kill the other. And there's a split-second decision when the cops come. What do you tell them? And what she says is, it was an accident. Uh, and maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't, right? But you can see the, the motivation that the mother might have to say that it was because she doesn't want to lose both of them. And what my editor said was, that's the story, and the reason that's the story is because any of us who are parents would have to think about what we would do in that situation. doesn't mean that we're good people or bad people, but it's, a, it's something that you would, you would have to consider. And it was funny, it's another story I spent almost a year on, and throughout the time I was working on it, um, people who knew the family or were from the town where it really increasingly looked as though in the 80s they'd kind of covered up this thing that happened, not just the family, but the cops and all these people who lived in the community, kind of out of compassion for the family. Um, people kept saying to me as I was reporting, they kept saying, do you have kids? You yeah. know, and, and, and there was this <laughs> sense that like that, that you know, that, that, that you, mm -hmm that that was kind of a prerequisite for understanding what the moral calculus was in the story. Right. And, you know, the chief of police becomes, in fact, you sort of, again, in this sort of cinematic way, we, we move away from Huntsville very quickly. Um, and the story, she was 21, I should have clarified that. She was 21, I think her brother mm -hmm. was 19 or mm -hmm. 18. So it happened quite a while ago, and she'd gone on to ha make this life for her. But, you know, you kind of show that this is... Well, and she'd never, but I mean, so in 86, after this happened, um, I mean, leaving aside the fact that she pulled the trigger of the shotgun, the imagine if you just had a, a young a kid who witnessed the death of a sibling. She never got any therapy, you know. Um, she they didn't move from the house, so she continued to. You know, her bedroom was right across from the bedroom where her brother had lived. She would eat breakfast every morning at the table in the kitchen where she had shot him. Um, so, you know, it, it, it clearly, there should have been some kind of intervention uh, back in the 80s to make sure that this person was okay. And what we learned much, much later in 2010 was that she really wasn't. 
Right. And when you were spending a year on this, are you just spending a year on this story alone nope. or no? <laughs> yeah, I should say there's always overlap because the um, uh, it's a lot of what I, the reporting that I do is it's very stop start. There's always, there's always documents you're trying to get or people who won't talk to you. And in that case, I initially, I didn't have Amy Bishop or her parents. Um, and then slowly, slowly what happened was the parents initially wouldn't talk to me. They hadn't given any interviews to anybody. Um, but I kept going back to the town and just talking to more and more people who knew them. And this is, I mean, it's one of the luxuries of writing for The New Yorker is that I can spend a long time and keep coming back. And then what happens is that, you know, the person who initially says, oh, I'm not going to talk, they keep getting phone calls from people they know saying, oh, I just talked to that reporter guy. You know, here's the questions he asked. Mm -hmm. And eventually they came around. And then finally, I think we were fact checking the piece when I got, um, uh, <laughs> this may be, I don't know how familiar or unfamiliar this is to those of you in the audience, but it's that, you know, it's a very distinctive thing where you get a phone call and it says, you are receiving a telephone call from an inmate in a penitentiary. <laughs> um, you get the kind of pre-recorded call. But I, um, and so I interviewed her uh, over the course of a couple of phone calls then. And did, I mean, in a way, she's this, I don't know if she's a fictional character, but she's not someone you know and yet you don't know. What was that like after a year of pursuit? It was strange. I mean, I think it's funny. I sometimes get questions. You know, my last book was about the Sackler family, and people sometimes say, what would you ask them if you could sit down in a room with them? And it's the funny thing about that question is I think a lot of the time you're dealing with people, and this would be true with the Sackler family and true with Amy Bishop in different ways, you're dealing with people who are so deep in denial that for somebody like me to come along and start asking tough questions is not actually going to be that fruitful a I'd like to think that I'm such a ninja at journalism that, you know, I would ask the question that totally disarms them and, you know, and then they say, you know, and I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for, you know. Um, but that, that's not what happens. I mean, most of the time what happens is they have a lie that they've told themselves. They have a kind of a world that they've constructed in which they're not the bad guy. And that's the world where they live. And so when you come and you start asking questions that are chipping away at that, right. um, Usually what happens is they just kind of double down on whatever whatever it is they've been telling themselves all these years. And what about the parents? So the parents w were a similar situation. It's funny, I've had this, situ this situation a few times. I just published an article in The New Yorker a few weeks ago w with a very similar scenario in that the article was about a guy who had done some pretty terrible things. And I interviewed the parents. And I feel great compassion for parents in those situations because they... Um, uh, because it's like a perfect bind, right? Like you're 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 connected to your child, and your child does awful things, and and how do you make sense of that? Um, and I think a lot of the time the answer is denial, and so um, it's really hard because I because I I feel great compassion for these people, but also my job as a journalist is not to protect them. Right. You know, my job is to get at the truth or the best version of the truth I can, and so. Um, you know, in the case of the bishops, what that meant was I spent, I visited with them twice, and there were all these things that they would say that just didn't make sense. You know what I mean? Like, the second time I saw them, it was after I talked to Amy, and she had told me about how she'd had a suicide attempt. So I'm talking with these two parents, and this is decades earlier, right? But, and I said, oh, well, Amy told me about the suicide attempt. They said, oh, she didn't have a suicide attempt. There was no suicide attempt. And I said, oh, it's strange, because she did tell me that she had. And they said, no, 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 she was, she was carving pumpkins, and she was testing the knife to see how sharp it would be on her wrist. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to, I'm not, it's, it's, it's excruciating to be in that right. situation, because you have, because clearly this is a reality that they've like, right. constructed together that they can live with. But my job is to, to kind, you know, to say, no, that doesn't make sense. But I feel like you really, when you read the story, if um, you really understand and in, in weigh the family dynamic, even in their denial. I feel yeah. like I mean, it, it's it's a mystery to me that I feel you actually solved in terms of the family dynamics. Um, oh, so, anyway, that that on a on a lighter. 
There are some lighter stories. It's all, it's all <laughs> sh shades of darkness. Yeah, I didn't yeah. really want to bring him up tonight, but I'm going to. Um, you profiled um, Mark Burnett, <laughs> who is probably responsible um, in some ways, you argue pretty well that we had Donald Trump as a president because Mark Burnett was the mastermind of the Celebrity Apprentice. And um, you don't get to Burnett, but you get so many wonderful details about him. And the good news is many people on The Apprentice wanted to talk to you. Um, and, and I want to just read this because this is extraordinary to me. I read this when it first was published in The New Yorker, but this is like a holy moly. Okay. Um, the Apprentice was built around a weekly series of business challenges. At the end of each episode, Trump determined which competitor should be fired. But as Braun explained, Trump was frequently unprepared for these sessions. I know that's a shock. With little grasp of who he had, who had performed well. Sometimes, I just love this, a candidate distinguished herself during the contest only to get fired on a whim by Trump. When this happened, Braun said the editors were obliged, often obliged, to reverse engineer the episode, scouring hundreds of hours of footage to emphasize the few moments when the exemplary candidate might have slipped up in an attempt to assemble an artificial version of history in which Trump's shoot from the hip decision made sense. Anyway, I just, I, I just that was amazing to me. And then here's another thing, and we'll, we can talk about it. The Apprentice portrayed Trump not as a skeezy hustler, isn't that great, skeezy hustler who huddles with local mobsters, but as a plutocrat with impeccable business instincts and unparalleled wealth, a titan who always seemed to be climbing out of helicopters or into limousines. Most of us knew he was a fake, Braun told me. He'd just gone through I don't know how many bankruptcies, but we made him out to be the most important person in the world. And here's the quote. It was like making the court jester the king. That's the chef's kiss to me, okay. <laughs> we walked through the offices and saw chip furniture. We saw crumbling empire at every turn. Our job was to make it seem otherwise. Uh, so let's talk about this. Yeah. Um, how did you come to this story and, uh, you know? So I, discovery? yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, um, this was another one. This was my editor's idea again. It's, it's interesting. There are people at The New Yorker who come up with all their own ideas. And there are people who never, whose names I shall not mention, who never come up with their own ideas. Everything is 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 handed to them uh, by editors. And for me, it's usually probably r like roughly two of mine to one of theirs, or three of mine to one of theirs. And this was another one that was my brilliant editor's idea, um, where he just said, you know, the thing that's so fascinating is that most people agree that, um, like, however people feel about Trump, most people agree that The Apprentice was this really significant moment in putting him on the national stage and kind of um, amplifying his, his brand, for lack of a better word. And, um, and then the other thing that was really interesting is that when he came into office, he, he really still thought about the sort of optics of reality TV. So some of you may recall when he announced his candidacy, there was this moment where he and Melania come down the gold escalator at, um, at Trump Tower, and like that, actual sequence, the way it was shot, everything, that happened in The Apprentice. It was like an outtake from The Apprentice. And it turns out that all of the supporters who were there that day were actually extras. They were day players who'd been hired to come and to cheer in the same way that you would um, for a reality TV show. And he would say, when he, when he was the videographers at the White House, he would say, shoot me like they shot me on The Apprentice. And so what my editor, what my editor said was, you know, this seems just so interesting, right? The idea that in some ways, this guy who we, we have all come to, uh, to know and love or hate, um, you know, he emerged sort of from the, like from the forge of reality TV. And the person who did this is this totally unlikely, just absolute hustler, this guy from East London, Mark Burnett, who was a, um, he was a British paratrooper he was going to go and be a mercenary in South America, um, but he, but his mom, when he left the military, but his mom like had a vision and said she didn't want him to do anything involving guns. And so on his way to South America, he just walked out of LAX. He had a, a transfer, so he was an illegal immigrant who uh, came to California Perfect. without a green card, <laughs> got a job as a nanny, as like a male nanny, um, for wealthy families in Southern California. <laughs> and um, so he was like the paratrooper turned Manny. 
<laughs> and, and then um, managed to sort of parlay his way. He had a show called um, Eco Challenge. And then his big uh, breakthrough was that there was this crazy Swedish, like early pioneer of reality TV, this Swedish, like little known outside of Sweden, um, this Swedish uh, show called Expedition Robinson, which involved um, like a bunch of Swedish people who were dumped on an island and they had to uh, kind of fend for themselves with a bunch of cameras. And Burnett saw it and he licensed this obscure Swedish show and he said, I want to give it a new title, Survivor. Um, and from there he, he did The Apprentice um, and he and Trump had this kind of strange relationship where he, he recognized, I, I think the term I used in the, in the piece is a ethereal charisma that Trump had. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, they just had this kind of amazing dynamic. And then Burnett ends up in this kind of weird situation where he, he didn't want to, part of the reason he wouldn't talk to me is that at that point he didn't really want to be associated with Trump, but he was also clearly so scared that he didn't want to disassociate himself either. Um, and he, got, he was born again, right? Yes. He, his third <laughs> wife um, is Roma Downey uh, of the show an Touched by an Angel. <laughs> Burnett's the kind of person who says of his wife, I literally married an angel. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and so, yes, he was born again. Um, and anyway, a fun kind of dive into, into Hollywood. But, I, but to me, the, there was a sort of deeper theme in that piece, which is that just that at a certain point, everything became entertainment. And that for, so for Burnett, like, there is no such thing. Like, politics is just entertainment by other means. And um, uh, I yeah, think Jimmy that's... Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel, like, cor like it, I don't know if it was the White House uh, correspondence. It, it was at the Emmys. Emmys. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. What did he say? He said... He yeah. said, well, this is, this is during the campaign. And what he said was that if he basically called out Mark Burnett, he said, if Trump gets elected, it's going to be this guy's fault. Um, and uh, he said, if they build that wall, we're going to throw you over it. Um, <laughs> Being but, an illegal uh, yeah. alien. <laughs> but, the truth, but the truth is, listen, I mean, Burnett kind of won. Burnett went on to, um, to run MGM, which he's MGM TV, which he's doing today. And uh, um, I think he, you know, he's sort of laughing all the way to the bank. Yes, yes. You have another beautiful, um, isn't it great when someone just quotes you to yourself? <laughs> I know it's <laughs> It's magic. Um, anyway, Burnett is lean and lanky with the ageless, perpetually smiling face of Peter Pan and eyes that, in the words of one ex-wife, have a Photoshop twinkle. And of course, what I love, in the words of one ex-wife, <laughs> that, that's just delicious. Well, there are, two, there are two of them, I know, and, but I, and, I, just and got, I talk to them but both. But it wasn't just yeah. an ex-wife, it was yeah. one. And maybe the other one doesn't agree, but um, um, anyway, I, so... Um, let's talk about the Thomas Jefferson wine. This mm. is the first story that's in the um, collection, and in some ways, it's sillier. I mean, it's that's a, I mean because totally it's, sillier. it's yeah. rich people messing up, which I kind of like, and um, uh, it's uh, it also stars a it features a Koch brother, um, one of the lesser Koch brothers, um, Bill. Bill, mm -hmm. right. And uh, Bill Koch uh, doesn't really, he, um, <laughs> he he's, has, po he's not the, a political Coke. He's not a political Coke. He's a consuming, uh, he's a consumption Coke. And uh, you have him living in a 35,000 square foot um, Anglo-Caribbean style house in Palm Beach, which you visited. And he had to excavate his... Um, <laughs> They were expanding when I visited because 35,000 square feet just wasn't enough. And they were expanding because he had so much crap in the yeah. basement, including wine. And um, he likes to buy things. And um, he says, I bought so much art, so many guns, so many other things, that if someone's out to cheat me, I want the son of a bitch to pay for it. He told me his color rising. Also, he said, I love these breaks, See, I'm quoting you back to yourself. Also, he said, relaxing a bit and breaking into a smile, it's a fun detective story. And in two years, he hired this incredible retired FBI agent who said it was like working for the FBI, with, but lots of money. He estimated that Co uh, um, Coke had spent more than $1 million on this case, twice what he paid for the wine. So let's talk about counterfeit 
wine yeah. and the Thomas Jefferson bottles. Yeah. How did this start? This one started because I have a friend who um, the uh, it's funny. I don't there may I don't know if anybody in the room listened to this podcast I did called Wind of Change, but the um, it's fabulous. But there's a character in that podcast who's my friend Michael, um, who is a longtime friend of mine and the source for he's just one of these people who's always feeding me really interesting stories. And he was the guy who set this that podcast sort of in motion. Um, so my friend Michael, the same friend Michael, um, emailed me in, I think it was probably 2006 or seven, and said, I have a new story for you, counterfeit wine. <laughs> and I just sort of thought, what is counterfeit wine? What does that even mean? Um, and when I looked into it, it turned out that there, um, you know, over the last kind of 20, 30 years, there have been these, there's been a huge, um, inflation in the, the price of rare wines. And there have also been all these rich people who, uh, uh, generally kind of new money rich people who've acquired a lot of money fast and then they want to have like a world-class wine cellar and they want it fast. And so they'll spend two, three, four, five million dollars on wine um, over the course of a couple of years. And the whole thing is kind of crazy. I mean, in part in that they're building these cellars that have so much wine that like they could never drink all the wine in their lifetimes. Um, this guy, Bill Koch, at a certain point I said, like, what's the point of buying wine you're never gonna consume? He had just shown me all his antique guns, including um, General Custer's rifle. And uh, so when I asked him why he would buy like 60,000 bottles of wine when he's 60 years old and there's just no way he's gonna be able to drink it all in his life, he said, I'm never gonna shoot Custer's rifle. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it turns out that um, as all that was happening, there were these really crafty wine fraudsters who realized that this was like the perfect crime because you can introduce these fake bottles which look like, you know, they either look like really antique wine or a lot of the time the price of a wine will vary from vintage to vintage. So it's like an 82 is really expensive and an 83 isn't. Sometimes you can make an 83 look like an 82. And they would do all this stuff. And what they had going for them was that the collectors have these huge sellers and they may never even get to the bottle in question, right? Because they're buying it more quickly than they're drinking it. And then if and when they do open the wine, most of these people can't tell the difference, right? <laughs> and it's like, it's totally the emperor's new clothes. And I'm sure many of you have had the same experience I've had where you go out for, you know, somebody's birthday and you spend a little more on a bottle of wine at dinner and you're asking yourself, God, is this really, like, yeah. is, is this any better than the cheaper bottle than the house wine? You know, I don't right. know. And a lot of really old wine is not even drinkable. I mean, you have uh, this marvelous quote again, the head of Sotheby's International Wine Department jokes that, there's been more 1945 Mouton was consumed on the 50th anniversary of the vintage in 1995 than was ever produced to begin with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's true. And, she, and that, same, that same woman, um, uh, Serena Sutcliffe, said that she thinks that the vast majority of fake wine is happily consumed. There was a guy who, um, I mean, it's the reason it's like the perfect, perfect crime. There's, my favorite story in that piece came from a guy who's like the wine director for a series of fa super fancy restaurants in uh, Vegas. And he told me this amazing story about how um, one night they had had these three bankers from New York who were in town celebrating some big deal that they'd done. And to celebrate, they ordered a bottle of 1982 Petrus, very fancy French wine. And 82 is a great year. And so this can sell in a restaurant for like $6,000 a bottle. And so they order a bottle and uh, it's fantastic, it's great. They like it so much they decide, special night, <laughs> no. they're gonna order another. So <laughs> second bottle comes out and the, you know they make a big show of decanting it and everything and they taste this one and this one just tastes off. It tastes weird, they don't know what the issue is but something's wrong. And so they apologetically say, we gotta return this, we're sorry, you know, it's, and, um, the, the wine director, the guy I talked to, is himself very apologetic. Oh, I'm so terribly sorry. We'll bring you out another one. But obviously, there's going to be like hell to pay afterwards, right? Because there's something wrong with that second bottle. So when the diners have left, they, the third bottle, I should say, that they bring out, the, it's great. The guys love it. It's fantastic. They drink that, and they leave. So afterwards, they bring the three bottles into the kitchen, and they're looking at them, and they're trying to figure out what the problem is with the second bottle. 
it was genuine. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. Um, um, do you ever get so overwhelmed by a story you say to your editor or your, your wife who had that beautiful quote about you, um, <laughs> no, no, uh, it, it's too much. This is, you know, this is like you know, the great white whale, I'm never gonna get it, it's gonna, the beast is gonna do me in. Um, Sometimes, I mean it doesn't, you know, the, I think I've gotten better over the years at um, knowing, uh, what's the best way of putting this? I'm, I'm big on storytelling. I'm big on um, having a kind of a, a clear narrative that runs through something. And that can be true for an article of the sort that are collected in here. Um, where, you know, these are, each one of these will take you maybe 45 minutes to read. And I actually love that about them, that it's like, you can really get into it, but you're going to be done in a sitting. It's not something that kind of sits there making you feel bad about yourself because you can't, can't finish it. Um, but this is also true with books. I mean, something like my Sackler book or the book I did before that on the, on the Troubles, um, there are these big complicated subjects and um, sometimes my frustration as a reader, not a writer, is that if I'm reading a book, I can tell that the material is really rich and it's really important, but I feel like not, a lot of, not enough thought has been given to how do you tell this as a story? How do you organize this? Where do you start? You know, how do you, it, it's almost as if the, the mm -hmm. writer sometimes takes your interest for granted. Um, and I feel like you have to fight for it all the time. And that involves kind of distillation and organization. So early on, I think there were times when I would take on a story and then I would, it's like getting lost in the woods. I would just, mm -hmm. I had all this material. I knew it was great, but I kind of couldn't see the path through it. Um, and I, I honestly, I think that when the writer feels that way, the reader is often going to feel that way too, right? Um, what I've gotten better at is sort of seeing, I do it really, really simply. I mean, I'll, for me, it's like it starts on a, the back of an envelope. I'll just say, what are the big beats? If I had to tell you this story in five minutes, mm -hmm. where does it start? Who are the characters? What are the big turns and twists? And where does it end? And I try and just lay that out in a very schematic way. And so n nowadays, I'm, um, I'm doing that from the very beginning. So mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't I'm, I never get lost in the woods anymore because there are some woods that are so like dark and dense that I just right. won't even go there because I can tell. Right. Um, the, the places where I get very discouraged are more having to do with reporting, where there's a story I really want to tell, but I, I just I can't gather enough mm -hmm. of the kind of material, good material that I want, mm -hmm. and so. Um, I won't tell you what it is in case there are any devious journalists in here who want to <laughs> steal it from me, but like, there's, there's an idea that my editor brought me a year ago that's amazing, and it'll be an incredible piece, but nobody wants to talk. And it's, it's sort of in the criminal justice system, and it's like, the bad guys don't want to talk, their lawyers don't want to talk, the prosecutors don't want to talk, the cops don't want to talk. You know, and, and so I'm just kind of, my hands are tied. There's like no way in for me, and so that happens sometimes. And but it's you did El Chapo, just I did. In before briefly, just before, because um, this is amazing, and the book opens with this. You went after this story. I mean, this is like a murderous machine of, of a drug lord, like the drug lord, and I'm sure your wife was thrilled with this. <laughs> um, and uh, tell the, tell. Uh, your readers, what happened after you did the piece, because we want to take questions soon, and what happened after that? Yeah, I mean, I, w I, w I will, with, yeah. the, with the caveat that I've, I've <laughs> that I told this story on, on, uh, on The Late Show last night, so hopefully. Yeah, he was only on Seth Meyers, and he's here today. So hopefully, none of you, hopefully none of you <laughs> saw it, because uh, you're going to hear me tell it again. Um, the, um, so I wrote this big piece about Chapo Guzman. I had actually written an earlier one for the, a cover story for the New York Times Magazine in 2012. And then when um, he was caught in 2014, caught the first time, um, <laughs> I, I wrote this piece called The Hunt for El Chapo. And I went down to Mexico and I had a lot of access and I talked to the, you know, the Mexican forces and the DEA who'd been involved in that, and I talked to a bunch of people who had worked for him and worked for the cartel, but I didn't talk to Chapo Guzman, which is, you know, sometimes the way it is. It's a write-around, right? And um, 
piece came out, and uh, a few days later, I got a voicemail in the office from a guy who said he was a lawyer for the Guzman family. And this made me a little nervous. Um, I hadn't thought about him reading the piece or anybody in his circle reading the piece. I think the problem is it got it, a bunch of the Mexican newspapers picked up on some of the revelations in the piece. So that was how they He's not a charter New Yorker. Heard about it. He's not right exactly. He doesn't he didn't strike me as a New Yorker <laughs> subscriber. <laughs> but the um, um, and actually when I when I when I mentioned this to Seth Myers last night he said no he he is he's just but he only reads the cartoons. You know, he skips <laughs> the but the um uh, and so I was very nervous, and I made a few phone calls. I called a guy who was a source for me in the government and said, is this guy really an attorney for the Guzman family? And he kind of ran a few checks and came back to me, and he said, um, he said, yeah, he really is an attorney for the Guzman family. He's like a real cartel lawyer, but he, like, he's one of these cartel lawyers who's like 60% cartel and 40% lawyer. And, um, <laughs> that was, and so I was just getting more and more nervous. And uh, I didn't tell my wife about this at all. And finally, when I called the guy, um, I, the thing I thought he was going to bring up is in the piece I had said that I had told the world that Chapo Guzman, when he was on the run, one of his big issues was he always needed to get Viagra. And, um, and that was like a whole logistical thing because he was moving from safe house to safe house and they had to make sure he always had plenty of Viagra. And, and there was a Mexican source of mine who had said, you know that this is the most macho country in the world, right? And I was like, yes. And he was like, you know that Chapo Guzman is the most macho man in this country, and you're the one who told everybody that he needs... Um, <laughs> um, but uh, So I thought it, I was all ready to have the Viagra conversation with the guy. <laughs> and um, and uh, he had this very kind of starchy, formal way of talking. And um, he said, when he established that I was guy who wrote the article, he said, you know, we have read your article. And I was like, oh, all right, thank you. And um, he said, uh, they, they all referred it to Chapo as El Señor. And he said, um, El Señor is ready to write his memoirs. <laughs> and um, I had, like, gamed out in my mind all the ways this, this was going to go. And I was ready. And I was, like, so ready for the Viagra thing. But I, this I just hadn't seen coming. And so I was just kind of like, ah, oh, that's a book I'd love to read. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and he said, but sir, is it a book you would like to write? <laughs> and um, so that was this kind of crazy situation in which I was offered the opportunity to ghost write El Chapo's memoirs. Um, and as, as you will have gathered by the fact that we're he talking about this, this, this book, book instead, instead. Um, I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't write El Chapo's memoirs, but I am alive to tell you about yes, it. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So my question to start is I read Empire of Pain, and it seemed at the end that you were still under sort of a spotlight from the Sacklers, and I was concerned about your safety and your family. They seemed to be staking out your home, and... Uh, and and lawyering up against you, how did that resolve? Uh, it was so. It's a um, good question. So, they kept up the pressure right up until like the eve of the book coming out. I was it was like a day or two before publication. I was doing an interview for the Today Show, and it was funny because it kept getting interrupted because the producer was like getting these furious, you know, text messages and emails from their legal and PR people. Um, and then the book came out and they went totally dark, totally silent, haven't said a thing. That was last April, haven't sued me. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, part of the story that I was trying to tell in the book, I think, I think with the Sacklers, it's a little bit like, I mean, honestly, it's a little bit like with Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein or any of these powerful people who get away with terrible things for a long time when it finally all comes out, there's a natural reaction I think a lot of us have to say, well, how could they get away with it for so long? And I think the answer a lot of the time is that they surround themselves with these people who are these kind of ostensibly respectable service providers, lawyers, PR people, private investigators, um, and consultants for McKinsey, you know, you name it. And those people, I think, protect them and insulate them, and they attack the messenger when somebody uh, critiques them. So there was a strange sense for me in which, on the one hand, I was it was very unpleasant getting two years of legal threats. Um, I could tell you some stories. Um, but And there was that episode I talked about at the end of the book where we had somebody staking out my house. And I should say they've never, they've never um, 
confirmed uh, that that was them, but it was the only project I was working on at the time. Um, and um, all of that was unpleasant, but it was important for me to tell the story because, because the truth is they've been doing that for 20 years, that stuff. And it's, I think, part of the reason that they got away with it for as long as they did. I wonder, um, how to make people talk to you? Like, do you pay them, like sources? <laughs> um, it's a great question. I, I'm not allowed to pay people. Uh, that, that's a kind of, it's interesting, because you know, like if you were a, a, a sociologist, you can pay people for interviews, and that's ethically permissible in journalism. There's, there's just no, no scenario in which you can do that at all. Um, it's a pretty bright, bright line rule. Um, I will say, just in the interest of honesty, that like there are little ways around that. Like, I mean, I that was, you know, it's varied from project to project for me, but like I wrote a book about Chinatown in New York City and Chinese immigrants, and I couldn't pay them for their time, but these were people who were working incredibly hard jobs. And so what I would say is, can I buy you a meal? And like that's permissible, right? Is that at least it's like at least can I buy you lunch or buy you dinner when you get off work? Um, but no, I'm not allowed to to pay people. Um, you know, I, I try and meet people where they are and um, persuade them that I'm gonna, uh, you know, that I don't, I don't really have an agenda. I just really want to kind of figure out what the truth is, and the truth is often complicated. And I write these long articles um, that kind of embrace complexity. You know what I mean? Like I don't even even the villains in my stories. I'm I I want to try and sort of understand how they see the world. Um, and so that's my pitch to people, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but the other thing, uh, to that point about the write around, is that I think, especially with powerful people, um, they use access as a kind of leverage. And I think there's way too much access journalism in general. And so for me, you know, I've noticed that sometimes what happens is if it's like a hedge fund manager, hedge fund manager, or um, you know, a reality TV producer or a banker or a pharmaceutical executive, and you say, hey, I'm gonna write about you, and they say, well, too bad, I'm not gonna give you an interview, and they think you're gonna go away, what I say is, oh, I'm gonna write about you anyway. You know, um, I will, I'll just have to do more work to find people who've known you over the years, but I will do it. And um, so that's part of my pitch to people, as I say, I say the train is leaving the station. Like, you can get on if you want. Um, I'd love it if you would. But if you don't, the train is still going to leave the station. It's not a thing where you have the agency to stop this. How early into the Empire of Pain did the sa were the Sacklers aware that you were working? <laughs> oh, this? OK. Funny you should say. So um, I said I had stories. Uh, they, I hadn't even started writing. So I, 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 wrote a, I wrote a piece in The New Yorker in 2017, which was which kind of put the spotlight on the family, um, maybe in a way that hadn't happened up to that point. And they didn't like that. And um, initially, I wasn't going to write a book. And then I decided I would write a book. And in early 2019, my publisher just put out a little announcement, like in publisher's lunch or something, like in the trades. Um, I mean, this was, it was not written up in the New York Times that I was going to be doing this. It was You would need a subscription to some publishing newsletter. and. Um, we got a 17-page single-spaced legal letter. Um, and on, on some level, I was just like, guys, let me start writing, you know? Um, uh, but that was the beginning of it. And um, that never really let up until just before the book came out. Wow. Are you as pretentious as your wife says you are? <laughs> for, for anyone who doesn't follow Patrick on Twitter, he is a great follow. Oh, thanks, Ed. <laughs> uh, my other question, I'd just like to publicly... She, I'm sorry, she, she called him incredibly pretentious. Was incredibly <laughs> pretentious. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> just want to publicly thank you for what oh. Empire of Pain has done, shining a light on the, you know, a family that's responsible for more deaths in America than any other family that I know of. And... Um, the other question is, uh, well, two questions. In your new book, which I actually got halfway through already. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> Thank you. If there was one story, if someone said, I can read one story, yeah. is there one story, what story would you recommend? 
And then uh, Painkiller coming out on Netflix. There is a total media lockdown on it. What can you tell us about that? How, how can I break the lockdown? Um, so a little bit of context here. This is Mr. Ed Bish, um, who has uh, been an incredible activist since long before I'd ever heard the name Sackler. Ed has been on this story and uh, fighting for justice and for accountability um, and uh, an inspiration to me and, and to many. So um, thank you for coming. Um, the, uh, so my wife gave an interview uh, to a guy who was writing a little profile of me in New York Magazine, and in, in this on-the-record interview, she described me as incredibly pretentious um, and said uh, that, that was, it was the opening line was about how she, she said, do you really need to write about these litigious assholes and um, murderous crooks? Um, uh, so yes, she really did say that. Uh, in terms of one story, um, I guess maybe the Amy Bishop story. You know, it's a dark one, but the but it um but uh I don't know. I mean, I think it's I think it's uh, it's one that many of us could relate to in weird ways that we might not anticipate, you know. Um and it's one that stays with me. I mean, I wrote that piece years ago and it it and it it does kind of linger with me. Um Painkiller is a limited series that's going to be on Netflix in the fall, I believe, I don't know that for sure, um, that is based on the book Pain Meyer, and then to a lesser extent, on, not on my book, but on my article uh, about the Sackler family. And um, uh, I've been, you know, somewhat involved, but, but not really all that closely involved. But they shot it in Toronto, it's going to be six parts. Um, Richard Sackler is played by Matthew Broderick. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it should be um, pretty interesting. Peter Berg, who's the director, has made a lot of movies, but he made, um, for Friday instance, he Night made Lights. Friday Night Lights. He directed all six episodes. Um, so keep an eye out. That's on Netflix in the fall. And I think it, it's, it's, some of you may have seen Dope Sick, which is terrific. I think it's different enough from Dope Sick that it might be worth watching both. As far as the Sacklers are concerned, are um, are they still pushing these awful drugs? And you mentioned that they were in a world of, of denial, but how do you stay in denial when the bodies are stacking up and uh, millions of people are suffering and in pain? How do you continue to stay in denial and you know, stack up billions and billions of dollars and you, you, you continue to stay in denial? I don't understand that. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, this is the thing I, I spent years trying to understand. Um, I mean, to, to answer the first part of your question, <laughs> so Purdue Pharma ends up, their company, ends up going into bankruptcy. And it seems a little weird that you'd have a, a company that's made so much money, you know, so many billions and billions of dollars selling drugs that they could go into bankruptcy. Um, but the reason is there were all these lawsuits against the company for the impacts of OxyContin. And over the course of about a decade before the company declared bankruptcy, quietly, the family was pulling money out of the company. So they took more than $10 billion out of the company. And then eventually, when they'd gotten $10 billion out of the company, and you suddenly have all these lawsuits against the company, they said, ah, too bad. No money left in the company. Uh, so the company has to declare bankruptcy. Um, eventually, Purdue Pharma got kind of wound down. Um, but they're still selling OxyContin. It's not the, the Sacklers. They've given up their interest in the, in the company. Um, there's a sort of a new company that's still selling OxyContin. Get this. Uh, so it continues to sell OxyContin, the drug that helped create the opioid crisis. But all of the profits from the sale of OxyContin are going to go to remediating the opioid crisis. Um, kind of enough to make your head explode. Um, on the denial thing, I mean, you know, it's... It's very weird because this is a family that, you know, they, they started marketing this drug in 96, and the idea was it wasn't addictive. And they hadn't done any studies, nobody knew that. Um, and almost immediately it turns out that there's all kinds of people getting addicted and overdosing and dying, and their kids dying. And word is getting back to the company. 
And it's funny because for me, when I look back at that, like we're talking, it's 2022 right now, but I'm talking about like 1999. I can't imagine having a multi-billion dollar company and a product that's out there in the world and getting informed, oh, kids are dying and, and not putting the brakes on or at least saying like, what have we done wrong? Um, but they didn't and they kept kind of doubling down and doubling down. And it's hard for me to understand that, but I think there's two things that came into play. One is that the family and the company made this pivot, which I hate to say it, but it's a very American pivot, where what they said was, oh, the drug's not the problem. The problem is the people abusing it. The problem is you have these people who have poor character, you know, bad values, addictive personalities, can't help themselves. So we've created this great drug and they're screwing it up. And if people are dying, it's their fault. Um, and we can kind of chuckle at that now, but like that's the most American idea imaginable. Guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? You can sell a dangerous thing and put it out into the world. And as long as somebody else is making some decision somewhere downstream, it's nothing on you, you know? You don't have anything to answer, answer for morally or, or legally. So I think that was part of it. The other part of it for me that was kind of surprising is I guess from the outside, um, so I'm not a billionaire, and um, from the outside, I would have thought that if you're a billionaire, you could get just the best advisors, that you would just have like state-of-the-art advice all the time. And what I found when looking at the Sacklers is it's actually kind of the opposite. Because you have all these people around you whose job depends on keeping you happy. And I think this was, you know, I think this is true of Donald Trump. I think this is true of Mark Zuckerberg. I think this is true of any number of people who are very wealthy and powerful that sometimes they can seem kind of disconnected from reality. And the reason for that is that they have all these people around them who when they say, oh, isn't day is night, right? And two plus two is five. These people say, oh yes, absolutely, sir. You're right. You know, all those people over there, don't, don't listen to them. It's, you know, they've got the wrong narrative. You're misunderstood. That's the problem. And I think that you know, part of what you see with the Sacklers, part of the reason they're still in denial, is that whereas the, the Bishop parents that I was talking about, Amy Bishop's parents, that's two people in a house alone. And they have this like reality they've had to manufacture on their own. With the Sacklers, they have an army of people who are reaffirming every day their crazy ideas about what is happening in the world and their own responsibility. So um, I don't fully understand it, but that's as close as I can come to an explanation. Like a shake. Um, say nothing a few years ago, so excuse me if I don't get all the facts right. I don't remember them either. <laughs> <laughs> but there's an awful lot of tension in the book, obviously, and conflict between the Protestants and Catholics. And you interview Bobby Shane and a lot of other people. I just wonder how you can keep your distance and not get sucked into each side, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think about this all the time. And with that book, you know, it's funny. I, I was just in Northern Ireland uh, talking about that book. Um, and I thought it was, you know, there's a great English expression about how it's like bringing coal to Newcastle. You know, it's like, do they really need to hear from me about the troubles? Um, but the thing is, I think being an outsider really helps. You know, that that when I started work on that book, I thought being an outsider was going to hurt because it's a it's a pretty clannish society, it's small, everybody knows everybody. Um, and I was kind of parachuting in. I have this obnoxiously Irish name, but I'm not, um, you know, my family on my father's side came over 100 years ago. So I don't have any real close connection to Ireland per se. Um, but what I found was that it actually really, really helped to, to not be from there. Um, the, <laughs> there are probably parts of Philadelphia that are like this. If you, if, you go to, if you go to Northern Ireland, the thing that's really interesting, right, is that somebody who's from Northern Ireland, as soon as they open their mouth and start talking, people can hear their accent. And as soon as they hear the accent, they immediately start making these judgments. They're like, okay, I know roughly where you're from geographically and what kind of school you went to and what religion you are and how you vote and what sports you like and what teams you support. And they're making all these judgments. And they may, they, may be tr they may be right or they may not, Right? But there's this thing with the accents where everybody's always trying to kind of locate everybody else. And I was like an alien. You know, I just kind of parachuted in from 
New York, um, which I think was helpful in terms of me not getting sucked in. It allowed me to be, um, you know, not, not objective per se, but it allowed me to kind of tell the story as I saw it and not feel like I had to satisfy one constituency or another. In fact, what I wanted to do was write a book that would kind of piss everybody off equally, which it did. Um, um, and then the other thing is that uh, I could leave, you know, is that I don't live in West Belfast. It would have been very hard for me. I mean, you've read the book. I won't give too much away for people who haven't, but there's a murder at the heart of the book that happened in 1972. And at the end of the book, I named the person who I think committed the murder. That person's still alive, and they had never been implicated before. And um, it would be hard for me to write that if I lived in Belfast. But because I could leave, I was able to. So it is a strange thing where I think sometimes being an outsider can help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all so much.